So yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Matt Fry from the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and I'm hosting this, uh, which is the fifth webinar in this AI for, uh, in Environmental Science series, which is supported by NERC and the Constructing a Digital Environment Programme. So this is a programme aiming to develop the digitally enabled environment, benefiting researchers, policymakers, businesses, communities and individuals alike. Um, and it's been running for, for a number of years now. Um, with the aim of envisaging and developing approaches to creating the future digital environment, exploiting advances in technology and uh, increasing diverse data sets to improve, uh, uh, sorry, exploiting advances in technology and increasingly diverse data sets to improve our understanding and management of the environment. Um, and it's done this through a number of funding, a number of projects, a range of other activities and building a community in the area of digital environment. Um, running events um, and a successful conference last year. And what, just to remind everyone that there's NERC's Digital Gathering 2023 is in July, the 10th to the 11th at the British Antarctic Survey offices in Cambridge. Uh, we're gonna post a link in the chat now. Um, it's still open for registrations and for submission of abstracts till the 30th of June. Um, so please do take a look and come along. So yeah, this, this um, webinar series has been fantastic. Range of different subject areas from environmental sensors to data management. Um, legal and ethical aspects of digital environment and decision making, um, as well as showcasing some of the projects in the digital environment program. And this is the seventh series of webinars. There's a fantastic resource of, of webinars on YouTube now. If you go to the uh, digital environment page, um, you'll find all the links through to all the different series organized by those series by subject matter. Um, and this seventh series is considering the role and the opportunity, as well as some of the pitfalls in the use of AI in environmental science. And the format is to invite a presentation from leading experts in the field, followed by a chance for, for question and answers. Um, and I'm going to please invite the audience now to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet done already um, to see the rest of the talks. So the pink link for that is going to go in the chat as well. So, yeah, so AI tools are enabling new analytical value to be delivered from existing sources of data, as well as providing powerful tools for gathering new data. Uh, and this webinar series is going to cover activities across this area. Um, very excited today to uh, say today's presentation is a seminar um, from Rosella uh, Arcucci from, from Imperial College London, uh, talking about data learning, which is integrating data assimilation and machine learning for reliable AI models. So Rosella is a senior lecturer in data science and machine learning at Imperial College London. She's an elected member of the World Meteorological Organization and the elected speaker of the AI Network of Excellence at uh, Imperial College, where she represents more than 270 academics working on AI. Um, she's been with the Data Science Institute at Imperial College since 2017, where she created um, and she leads the Data Assimilation and Machine Learning or Data Learning Group. Thank you very much, Matt, for the introduction. Let me... First of all, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, today for this, uh, for this webinar. Um, today I'm going to give an overview about what we mean with data learning, what we mean about this um, integration of uh, data simulation and machine learning, and especially I will focus on a few aspects, including uh, uh, why we want to do that what we do, what types of applications we are uh, working on, especially in the context of environmental science, given the, uh, the topic of the webinar. And, um, and uh, yeah, I will show you uh, quite a few applications, but um, the talk will be high level. Happy to have follow-up discussions with the one that want to go deeper in the details. So, um, the content of these of the next few slides will be essentially I will give an overview about these uh, data learning in the context of AI. As for the title, we do that for reliable AI models. So uh, it's good to just to be on the same page, uh, mentioning what we mean with that. Um, as I said, I will show you a few data learning models and I will give you examples of um, real world applications. Uh, just to be sure we are on the same page. Over the next slides, I will focus quite a lot on this balance between efficiency and accuracy of um, the models we are developing. When, I'm, when I say efficiency, I mean literally uh, computational cost. Uh, efficiency can mean different things in different contexts. In this context, we uh, literally mean uh, computational cost. About the accuracy, also for the accuracy, uh, you can have different definitions in different contexts. Uh, here, we mean that our models want to be um, as much as possible close to the real world 
scenario. And so, reliable AI models, but uh, what is an AI model for us? I'm sure usually when I, when I give this kind of talks in person, finally now in person, um, usually I have people to raise their hand <laughs> when they have already an idea about what is AI, but um, let's say that virtually, you already have anyway an idea we are in the era of artificial intelligence so just to be sure that we are on the on the on the same page let's say uh, for us <laughs> yeah there are a few people raised hands um ai is um is essentially the ability of a digital computer or a computer controlled robot to perform tasks that usually will be associated to an intelligent being and so, um, in this context, over the next slide, there are different, uh, as, as Matt was saying in the introduction, I work um, now as AI speaker at Imperial. Uh, so there are lots of people working on AI from different perspectives. Over the next few slides, when um, our AI models that I will show you are most of them based on something called artificial neural network. Just to be sure that why we say artificial neural networks. And essentially, we are trying to uh, replicate um, in vitro, let's say, with models, what we have in our brain. So this is the basic of our artificial intelligence models. And uh, as we in our brain, we have our biological neurons with connectors, synapses, and um, the neurons are connected one to another. The same way in our models, we have these neurons and we have these inputs and outputs and the neurons are connected among them. So the difference is that obviously in our brain, there are chemical reactions in, the, in our artificial neurons. There is something called processing unit. I have to say I'm a mathematician, so I can be sometimes really boring. I can see boring because as I am <laughs> a mathematician, I can say that without uh, any complaint from our other colleagues. Uh, I will not give you any details about the math behind the processing units, but it's just to, uh, for people that are not completely familiar with, with, with the, what is an artificial neural network, behind these processing units, there, are, uh, there is lots of math. There are function, cost function, loss functions to minimize, and uh, lots of math. But as I said, this talk will be quite high level. It's uh, for you just to um, show why you want to do that and what you can do with that. Then about the how, we can have like follow-up discussions. And so as for us, for our um, uh, uh, neurons in our brain, essentially, especially when we are children, when we are child, we have like uh, a lot of information coming in our brain from the stuff that we see, the stuff that we smell, we touch, etc. So lots of information are coming to our brain, developing the networks of our neurons. Same way, artificially, we need data for that. And so, when I say data, and you will see over the next slides, I mean literally on almost everything. This can be like information, factors, numerical data, data from social media. So any source of information that you can imagine can be actually used for these types of uh, models. And I have to say that we are very lucky because we are in the era of the data. And just to give you uh, an overview about the possibilities considering different sources of data, different sources of information, the data I'm showing over the next slides are coming from computational modeling, for example, for weather forecasts, or uh, computational model for more environmental uh, forecasts. Uh, for example, you can see here, it is like um, Elephant and Castle in London, uh, data from social media, data from sensors, satellites, so remote sensing, and also numerical data coming from, um, for example, financial markets. I will show examples of some of this. So why we said, why we want to do that? What is the main motivation behind the development of these models? The reason is because we are like uh, in the so-called era of digital twins. So essentially, what is a digital twin is a literally digital version of something real. 
So you can do that for healthcare. For example, we have in one of our uh, UKRI project, um, uh, the modeling of lungs to study the impact of the pollution. You can do that for energy applications. You can do that for any um, real world application that can give you enough sources of information to be uh, digitalized. So when I say that, and then people feel, oh yeah, I understand digital twins, but actually, what is that? So lots of people are talking about digital twins uh, today, but the key question, when you go to the core of the point and you want to develop a digital twin, how can you do that? What is that? And what are the good points that you can have? What are the problems you have to face in developing this kind of um, uh, stuff? So what is actually a digital twin for us, for example? There are lots of people talking about digital twins. Also in my group, we are working on digital twins. And obviously the interest is that when you have something completely digitalized, then you can simulate scenarios. So you can assess the risk and, uh, and stuff like that. I will show you a few applications of, of this. But what is a digital twin in like, um, in the context of AI and uh, data learning, machine learning, is essentially something that is, um, uh, is a, a model, digital model, data-driven, not completely data-driven most of the time. There is also some physics. And so we, uh, most of the time we talk about physics informed machine learning models. Um, at all time, you want to be sure that your model is realistic and especially is reliable. So you have to include at all the time uncertainty quantification and especially the minimization of this uncertainty. And also you want to work in the context of explainable models. So in a context of explainable AI. So the, especially most of the people we collaborate with uh, as data scientists, the people are coming from, for example, they are physics, biologists. You cannot say this is like a black box, it works. They want to understand what is behind that. So we try to, provide explanation about what is behind our models. And when you try to work on developing these kind of models, uh, most of the time we can say it's not actually straightforward. Because when you have data, even if you have meaningful data, it's already a good step. Sometimes you want to answer a question from the real world and then you don't have meaningful data for answering that, that question. But assuming that you have that, then you have like most of the time few problems to face. Sometimes data are not enough or data are completely unstructured. I'm sure you have seen lots of beautiful uh, models online uh, uh, showing how much learning can work with images of cats and dogs. And, uh, but then you work in environmental science and data are coming from sensors, so sparse, unstructured, and you can uh, apply the same methodology. So, Another problem, data most of the time in uh, these types of real world application are too big. You cannot run that even sometimes on a good machine, you need supercomputers. And especially these types of data are updated at all times. So you have new information coming from, for example, satellite sensors at all time. And you want to be sure that your model can be fine tuned properly. And so, this is the focus on, of this talk. I will show you how to face some of these problems. If one of these problems is coming, and even if you have meaningful data, what is the um, strategy that you can implement? And so, as we said, we have these data, few problems, most related to dimensionality constraint, the noise in the data, and so on. So this is the reason why when we work with machine learning, we don't only work with machine learning models, with deep learning models especially, but we couple, we integrate data science with that. So implementing good data science models before or with your deep learning, machine learning models is like the missing piece. In our case, most of the time, our data science technology, like the one that we use most of the time is data simulation. And this is the reason why we call our models uh, data learning. 
And so data learning models are completely general. I will show you examples of these. They, we apply that to social science, to medicine, lots of geoscience in a lot of different contexts in different projects in collaboration with other universities. And I will show you some of these applications. I will show you what you can do if you are also interested in how you can implement these models. I'm giving you uh, this paper, like you can, um, suggesting you this paper uh, where we are, this is like a data learning uh, 1.0. <laughs> now we are publishing data learning 2.0. Uh, essentially is an overview about the possibilities and the different models that you can apply to real world scenarios, depending on the type of questions you want to, you want to answer. And so in the paper, you will see lots of different models apply to lots of different applications. So somebody can, can get lost because you have like a, um, data simulation with the uh, reduce of the models and then with the uh, principal component analysis, for example, with neural networks, with the autoencoders, encoder, decoders, uh, Gaussian processes and data simulation, Kalman filter and convolutional neural networks. So people feel like, okay, lots of stuff, but what is the key point? What is the real expertise of a data scientist? When somebody goes, somebody from, for example, a company, a corporate, or somebody who is not an expert of data science, going to a data scientist saying, I have this problem, can you help me? The key point is understanding what is the model you need to apply. And there are different ways, obviously, everybody's working on their own approach, like they are experts of something, they try to apply that model to the specific real world application. I can share with you with what is my own way <laughs> to decide, but the first direction to follow when uh, um, a, real, a question from a real world uh, comes to, to be answered. So essentially the way I decompose, let's say, the different models uh, to choose what is the best one uh, in that um, real world application, specific question for the real world applications, is essentially the key point, um, the one of the key point is this balance, accuracy efficiency. And this is coming from the application. To give you an example, if you want to work on healthcare uh, modeling, and I gave you uh, just like an example, we work on lungs modeling, like um, detection of disease on lungs modeling. Do you care more about accuracy or do you care more about efficiency? So the point is that if you have your prediction in six hours, it's not a big deal, but you want to be really accurate. You want to understand if you are predicting the disease with a high level of accuracy. You want to be sure about that. But on the other side, if you are talking about storms, hurricanes, wildfires, I will show you something about the wildfires uh, we, we develop in collaboration with the Leverum Center for Wildfires. Do you mind if the prediction of the fire front is one meter more towards north, one meter less towards south or stuff like that? Or do you really want to understand where this is going now, what is the direction, then one meter can be an approximation, who cares? You want to be accurate, of course, but not that level of accuracy is important for you. What is really important is the efficiency. And so application oriented on one side, other side is data oriented, depending on the availability of the data you have. So if you have historical data and you have good historical data and you want to clean, you can clean it and use it, or you have like more an online problem. When I say online, I mean that you have data coming at all time and you need to integrate this data in your system because new data in your case means completely different scenarios, for example. And this is what happened uh, with um, with weather forecasts, for example, you want to update the systems, right? And so just to give you a few examples of the opportunities, as I said, this will be very high level, just showing you the opportunities, then I'm super happy to have follow-up conversation. You can always send me an email and we can have a chat about the deep 
um, models that are behind this application. So I was um, optimal data selection. This is key when um, this happens sometimes to us. People come and they say, okay, can, uh, can you help us answering this question? We have this data. And you look at the data and you feel like, why this data instead of other data? Why you didn't come before collecting the data is sometimes it's better if we can suggest you what data you can collect. And so I'm giving you an example um, of application in environmental science. Imagine this um, has been quite a uh, used tool for us during COVID for understanding the air quality in indoor environment. So you want to put some, uh, you want to understand what is the air quality in an indoor environment. And then you have data from sensors and you place these sensors just randomly. And then you see that actually, if you put the sensors only, let's say randomly, you have a certain accuracy. For example, in that case, it was not too bad, 0.17 of accuracy. But then if you use these technologies based on Gaussian processes, mutual information and uh, data simulation, you can actually have a good reconstruction of what is the air quality within the room. And so the error, MSE is uh, here, mean square error, the error goes down from 0 0.17 to 0 0.0005. And the key point here is that I'm mentioning here in the environment, but this is, as I said, very general. So you can do that, for example, for outdoor environment. And we have done, we have done that in a, in a project the magic project, uh, it was like a big project, EPFSC. And um, also for outdoor environment, depending on where you place the sensors, because in the street, you have this natural ventilation, luckily. <laughs> so you have wind. So depending on where you place the sensor, you can have a realistic uh, measure of what is the air quality in that place or a completely unrealistic because it's like, um, it's just like a particular point, particular spot. And so what is key of these types of technology, so the collection of re the, the data in the proper places is that you can have with just few dates, a uh, few points, few data, a very good representativeness of the entire scenario. Um, this is quite important in the context of uh, smart grids, obviously. Uh, we are now in the era of these um, smart buildings. Uh, we wish to have smart buildings uh, telling us open the window or close the window, depending on uh, what is the air quality inside and outside, for example, or the temperature indoor um, and these types of suggestions. But if you want to have like a clear vision of what is indoor and what is outdoor to have these smart systems, then you need to have good data, good collection of data. And so this became key in these uh, types of um, uh, applications, let's say. Um, other types of problems is when you say, okay, I have my own idea about what is the physics behind my model. But I don't have a clear idea of what is the value of the parameters. And so, for example, just to give you a completely different scenario so that you don't feel like these applications, these uh, models can be applied only to specific applications. Uh, one of the applications we, we considered was um, uh, the Bitcoins in, in general, the cryptocurrency market, because it is so volatile and crazy that you cannot really imagine to have a clear vision um, about the physics behind. So, we imagine to have like a description of an economic model. Uh, and then we try to learn these parameters like describing uh, um, the evolution, the, um, how the parameters were varying in time. And so using these types of models, these data learning models that I'm sharing in uh, these uh, papers, essentially what you can do, you can learn the values of these parameters of the available data in time, in real time, and then make 
prediction of a few time steps and then re-update and re-update and re-update. And when you do that, every few time steps, you have a really good uh, then um, accuracy in terms of short-term forecasting. And um, luckily, these models are general enough because when the um, when the pandemic actually exploded and at the very beginning it was um uh, so i was uh, at that moment a fellow research fellow in the data science institute at imperial and so one of my colleague um, she's from juan uh, she's now a lecturer uh, in another university but um and so we were like uh, focusing on this scenario so what, what was happening in one and we did have like the power of our technologies but we didn't have like uh, uh, anything else let's say just few data and so just with the ability to work with the lack of information you can really try to to learn something but we have been um able to present uh first results uh in um at the Royal Society in February 2020. And then if you remember on March, that, that was declared to be a pandemic. But uh, we were focusing on, on one in that, uh, in that specific moment. And what essentially we applied the same technologies we developed for the cryptocurrency market. And we used that for the epidemiologic model. Exactly the same. We had like another model with other different parameters, the, trans the transmissions parameters. And we have few data coming from hospitals, coming from the government. And so we were learning these parameters, try to uh, make like uh, right predictions. And of course, for the cryptocurrency market, you can imagine why you want to do that. But for the pandemic, the key point of building these digital twins for the scenario for the pandemic was that having digital twins can help you then simulating different scenarios. So for example, simulating mitigation effect, do you remember the two meter rules or uh, simulating suppression effect, lockdown, so no contacts at all and understanding like different, um, having a good a digital twin for that was helping us simulating these types of, uh, of scenarios. And so, um, yeah, as you can see, you, you can, we, we had like a quite a good um, then adjustment in terms of uh, what the model was predicting and what was happening then um, in real life. Still, in the, in the context of data and when you want to improve accuracy and stuff like that, there is this, this problem of data augmentation. So essentially, most of the time, not most of the time, in some applications, you don't have enough data. Because uh, collecting data can be very expensive, or expensive can be in, in terms of computational time, or expensive in terms of money, because you don't have, like, uh, for example, data coming from the laboratories uh, from the, for drug discovery. They cannot really produce lots of data, because Anytime they do experiments, it's costly and stuff like that. So you want to work on data augmentation. Increase the data you have, um, simulating synthetic data. Now, I'm not sure you know this website. This person doesn't exist. So we don't have time now to navigate that and play together. But if you just Google it, I'm sure you can just Google it, and any time you refresh the page, you see a different person. Different person completely artificially simulated. So, for example, this person doesn't exist. This person doesn't exist. This doesn't exist. Some of them, you will never say that they don't exist, but actually these people are completely artificially generated. So you say, okay, but environmental science so why this is important to you other people are. now imagine you're working with completely different application um, waves energy converters in one of, of my project we work on waves energy converters and simulations 
from computational fluid dynamic simulations of the waves energy converters and what happens and how much energy they are producing depending on different waves, etc., is so costly in terms of computational science, uh, computational um, uh, run, is that we try to answer this question, can we generate synthetic data, 3D synthetic data with a physics meaning? Because this is what we have. The application is that, so this is a 2D slide, but this is a 3D uh, simulation of waves energy converters. So this is too costly. So we were checking if it was a possibility. And I'm very happy to say that, uh, yes, you can. Obviously, it's not too straightforward, but happy to share with you. I will, at the end of the presentation, I will share with you the code, uh, our GitHub, so you can have access to all this. And so the point was in that case was that for this simulation, they needed like two weeks to run that. When you do that completely synthetic, you have, uh, you need only 0 0.05 seconds for 100 samples for the, um, uh, within the reduced space and 3.46 seconds when you go to the real, actually physical space, let's say the physics space that a physics will expect to see. So 3.47 seconds is like compared to two weeks is a great achievement, obviously, we have to be careful about the checking of this data just to be sure that this data had like a physics meaning. I have to say that everything we are doing, we are always in a multidisciplinary, um, multidisciplinary group so that we have any time like the feedback from our colleagues, just to be sure that it's not like a, something digital twins for something unrealistic, but we want to be sure that this can be used by the people that have to use that in real world. <clears throat> and so when you have data and you want to update that, then another example, data simulation. What is data simulation? If you're not familiar with that, for example, here on the bottom, you have um, simulations of um, a car accelerating in a junction, for example. And then at the top, you have um, the reconstruction from a sensor. So the, the computational fluid dynamics software is saying, this is what is um, happening. The sensor is saying, is this is not. So you want to integrate this information in your system. And so you can do that with this so-called data simulation. And you can do that with a standard approach I'm showing you here or with something more um, data-driven, like this one. And uh, what is the difference between a standard approach and something completely uh, like based on, on machine learning is that you can be faster. Keeping the same accuracy with machine learning, you can be um, like one order of magnitude faster. That can be key when you want to update informations in real time. And so uh, one real world application of that is something that we do with uh, the use of satellites and Wi-Fi. So we have our Wi-Fi simulation, but then to adjust the fire front and what's going on, we keep um, ingesting information from data coming from satellites. So this, as you can imagine, this must happen um, in almost real time. So this must be very, very quick. If not seconds, even milliseconds sometimes. Data simulation to adjust uh, simulations, but also sometimes we have like data fusion. As we said at the beginning, we are in the era of data. So we have data coming from lots of different sources. So what is data fusion in this scenario? Just to keep like, uh, to be on track with the, um, uh, with the Wi-Fi application, one question that we were answering is, uh, um, with these uh, Wi-Fi applications, one of our problem is that uh, for forecasting is okay, but for the now casting, when you want to really see, um, understand if a wildfire is happening now, 
satellites are like not great in these because actually we have the time that the satellite is there, takes the image and then send the image to our Earth planet and, and we check it. Then there is a time lag of at least three hours. But three hours for a wildfire can be quite a lot. So we were wondering, can we use other sources of information at least to understand if something is happening, then we adjust that with satellites. So the answer was, yeah, let's try with social media. And this is something that we have done. So essentially we have this system, we have built this system that uh, essentially is a checking tweet at all the time and filtering, uh, of course, and um, checking the reliability of the tweet and stuff like that. And then if something is happening somewhere, then we, the, you can simulate what is going on because with tweets you also have the geolocation or you are able to build, uh, to reconstruct the geolocation. And then combining this data with data from satellite can help us reducing this time lag quite a lot. And so this is something that we have done. For example, you can see here um, what we can really see, uh, predict just with the, with the tweet. And then we adjust that after. But um, a mean square error uh, for, for the geolocation of these types of uh, value is like, a, is small because actually, of course, when you are tweeting something about wildfire, you are not in the center of the mission, hopefully, otherwise you are not typing on your phone and you are maybe running, um, but if you are far, so we, this gives us at least the region that we have to check with the satellite. And so this was for, um, let's say, uh, data fusion and data fusion of Two different satellite, uh, two different social media. Uh, what can be, for example, data coming from Twitter, data coming from Reddit. So you can still apply these technologies. That's just to give you like an overview. And if you are thinking, yeah, but my technology, my problem has slightly different data. This is just to say, you maybe you can still use that. So you may want to take a look. And so uh, still merging or fusion of data, it was something during the pandemic, we were trying to understand what happens when somebody's sneezing or coughing, but we cannot really simulate all types of nose and mouth, right? We are all completely different. And in a simulation, a nose is literally the inlet of the in injection, let's say, in the, in the air. So what we were doing is building this system that essentially gives us a general simulation, but then this can be adjusted depending on the different shapes of the nose or the mouth and stuff like that. And so this was like for more uh, data fusion. So <laughs> when you have then all these like work done with data and sometimes Sometimes you want to build something called surrogate models. So these models are able to simulate then the digital twin. So let me give you examples. This is, for example, the um, uh, campus of Imperial College, the part in South Kensington. So you can see this round here is the uh, Albert Hall. This is um, then Hyde Park. And this is what happens in the morning when all the bars and the cafes and restaurants are opening. So the pollution is like uh, starting. <laughs> so um, beautiful, you can have a good digital twin with that. Uh, however, the point was that to have these uh, simulations, you need like crazy, like uh, amount of execution time. So it's really slow. So we were uh, trying to build then these models completely data driven that are um, able to simulate what the computational fluid dynamic is able to do, but in real time. Just to be careful about that, because at the very beginning years ago, when we started, our models were able to simulate that, but they were start exploding after a few, few time steps. But then we uh, are started, we have started implementing these um, concept of adversarial training and so our uh, surrogate models are now more stable and reliable just to be sure uh, just to mention that behind these models 
there is no like there are no beautiful images um, of the scenario, but actually there are completely unstructured grids, a uh, 3D unstructured grid. So this has been one of the main challenges for us because we wouldn't be able to apply most of the available deep learning, machine learning models, but we had to build uh, our own versions. And so something more sophisticated that's just to share with you, only because I'm uh, sharing with you all the code for that, um, that can give you even like a higher and longer stability when you, when you run your simulation with your data. Obviously to train this model, you need time series. And um, if the model is too, too, too big, let's say that you can, even on your computer, you cannot do that, you can still develop something called domain decomposition. So you can decompose the data properly and run that on uh, big supercomputers. And this is what we have done, for example, with, um, with the Barcelona Supercomputing Centers. This is an example of uh, the impact of these types of models. Something that we really care about, obviously we are working for net zero, towards net zero, right? So the point is that sometimes you try to simulate these scenarios um, to reduce the emissions, and then you, your simulation is so heavy that you are consuming lots of power, and so you are actually emitting a lot. So something that we are trying to take into account when we develop models is just to be sure that our models are also efficient on that extent. Uh, aspect. We want to be sure that we are not running models all the time and emitting. So uh, this is like um, uh, one important aspect for us. Um, I'm going towards the end, but just to, because at the very beginning, as I told you that this is completely general. And just to show you that this is completely general, I'm sharing here like another application. This is um, essentially oil and water in a pipe. And the computational dynamic simulation for this uh, simulation was taking 40 hours. Um, and uh, our data learning model is taking for the same uh, only one minute. And we have uh, explored like a very macro, like wildfires, and then something in the middle, like uh, now engineering, air pollution. But can we do that also for micro? For example, if I want to uh, use these types of technologies, data learning technologies for droplet coalescence, droplet conformations, for example, um, silver nanoparticles, then we work uh, within another of uh, the project, Clinier, within on that. So you can still do that. You can apply these types of models from like macro to micro. And so obviously, <laughs> This will be uh, impossible for me uh, without the help of all the postdocs and the PhD students working with my group, so the data learning group. And uh, I really always want to say thank you to all of them for their enthusiasm. And especially a couple of stuff that I want to share with you. We also have like a weekly meetings and we have a YouTube channel with, um, with these talks from uh, people, invited speakers coming from other universities or companies. So in case you are interested, please uh, take a look. At, if you are spe specifically interested in the topic, then there is a list of these talks and there is um, our link on the YouTube channel. Also, if you're interested in these integration, data simulation, machine learning, dynamical system, there is a, commu a community behind that is uh, like an increasing international community. And we have a annual uh, meeting now, this year will be in Prague. Um, I'm sharing this with you because if you're interested that you can check the proceedings because they all submit uh, papers for that. So if you're interested in understanding what is the state of the art, happy to share. And as I said, we have also a GitHub. So all the codes and uh, that we have developed for these applications are on our GitHub. So happy to, to share. And uh, with this, I just want to say thank you very much again. And I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you very much, Rosella. That's fun, uh, fascinating. That's an excellent talk. Um, yeah, we've please everybody post your questions in the Q&A. 
um, and we've got a few there already, so I'll, I'll just read them out if that's okay, Rosella. Um, so firstly, from Matthew Smith, do you equate digital twin with data constrained model? And if not, what are the key differences? Uh, so for me, I can say for me, a, a digital twin is um, a good digital twin, an efficient and effective digital twin is um, a combination of models and data. So this must be like, uh, it's not only data driven, it's not only physics driven, but an effective digital twin model comes from the, the fusion of the two. And on, on, on that point then, when, when we talk about data assimilation methods, some of those, it sounded like you were um, assimilating to sort of statistical or data-driven models, and some of them you're assimilating to process-based models. In, within, with the process-based models, which I guess a lot of people in environmental science are interested in, um, what, what, what does the assimil assimilation, what are you adjusting? Is it model states at any particular time or at changing model parameters and things like that? Can you describe? Yes. So uh, something that I, I skipped uh, in this um, presentation is essentially the why you do data assimilation. Uh, most of the time you do that uh, because um, when you adjust the initial condition or the boundary condition or the parameters of your model, you can then have like uh, the impact on the output, right? So uh, when, usually when we do data assimilation, we fix on one time step. So we, we arrive to that time step. So we just new formation, depending on the specific. For example, for um, the air pollution propagation, so the airflow, it was the initial condition and the boundary conditions. So in this software called Fluidity, but it's the same as OpenFOAM or other software, essentially you have your um, checkpoint. So you change your checkpoint because you learn something external. You change the checkpoint and then you continue with your simulation. This can be also done for parameters. And this is what we have done, for example, for the epidemiologic model, adjusting the parameters. Depending on what you can learn, initial condition, boundary condition, or parameters. OK, thanks very much. So we've got another one related to the wildfire example and the tweeting. If it says, if, the, if those tweets were kind of archived and not live, not live, you're actually only getting the historical data. So. Um, and that would be available even through the historical satellite data. So why not use the satellite data rather than the tweets, which might have bias in them? So I guess it's, can you get the tweets in real, very real yeah, time? Yeah, you can. You can have the tweets in real time, yeah. And uh, I have to say that at the very beginning when we started this study and uh, um, the PhD student working with me was monitoring also my Twitter account, I was like, so I, when, when, if you have tweet, Twitter, 99.9% of probability your tweets are available. So with the API, you can monitor what people are talking about. And if they are talking about Wi-Fi or fire or stuff like that, obviously with a filter, because if somebody writes I'm on fire, it doesn't mean that there is a Wi-Fi, but <laughs> with proper filters, you can monitor that in real time, yes. Yeah, we had the same with a, a drought project, looking at, at text and finding lots of gold droughts being the most thing, football droughts. Um, somebody said asking again about the digital twin. So, and this, I guess the saying, so it sounds like your definition might just be that a digital twin is just a model of something or is it then, is it more complicated than that? Is, so, is the model plus an adjustment from the data? And so that real time part, part is very is important. It's in is real it? time, yeah. Okay, that's great, thanks. Um, um, digging into a bit more detail, somebody, uh, Giovanni, says that's a fan fascinating talk. Thank you. Could you please further elaborate on how noise in experimental data is managed? For example, in air quality applications, is it filtered or modeled? And I would expect forecasting or now casting performance should be significantly affected by noise levels. Oh, absolutely. So essentially, something that is really important, uh, and uh, maybe I forgot to mention in this talk, is that um, uh, lots of people, especially in the machine learning community, they talk about the ground truth. So we have ground truth. You can do that when you, you actually have images or something like photos of something. But in environmental science, in geoscience in general, we don't have ground truth. We don't trust data. We don't trust data coming from models. We don't trust data coming from sensors, from satellites. So what is the way we manage that? Um, with these data simulation models, you have the possibility 
with a pre-analysis of the data to build some ways called the cover, error covariance matrices that you actually use to balance your data. So to balance, to balance how much you trust data. What I mean is that if you trust a lot some data, these weights are like small. If you trust less this data, uh, the weights are big. So depending on the um, on the um, the trust you have in this data, given the pre-analysis on the quality of the data, then you can ingest this information in your model. And so when you ingest data, you already know that the data is noisy and you cannot do anything about that. The, the real world is the real world, right? Um, but at least you can balance how much you want to take into account coming from this data. That's great. Okay, and, and just so some of the visualizations you showed, like the, um, the street level um, computational fluid dynamics um, are very kind of interesting. Do you think you could use those kind of um, visualizations to actually convey the uncertainties in the model alongside the, the state of the model? Oh, yes. Actually, this is something that we do. Uh, so we have like the simulation. And then on the side, we also have like uh, the same simulation, but just showing the error. <laughs> like so that we we better can we better visualize where we are making bigger mistakes, let's say, though this is very important. Yeah, you can do that. Please. You can do that with something called Paraview. Sounds great. OK. Um, somebody Williams asked, said again, great talk. Um, could you share your views and experiences of the best digital twin software? Is it is, is that a, a realistic so question? I, I wish to say there is a there is a best digital twin software, but I think he strongly is um, strongly data um, say application oriented. So I've been working with a lot of people. Uh, they were using I don't know. Fluidity, other were using open form um, or uh, people like uh, coming from operational centers. For example, we are working now um, with the Aero Mediterranean Center on Climate Change. They, they have their own software. And so it's like um, this is strongly application oriented, I would say. Um, but if you are if you're just starting, for example, I think open form in environmental science, these types of simulation, maybe open form can be easy. And there's a related question from Matthew Smith. Have, have the tools you use for encoding models changed in recent years? Um, is there still lots of kind of Fortran and C++ or using more modern languages and frameworks like Julia and TensorFlow? <laughs> so uh, very, very good question. Actually, there is, uh, you know, um, we are the, I, I, I sometimes I say we are the bridging community. So we try to bridge people working on uh, this application since years, and they have very solid softwares developing Fortran in C++, and there is no way to translate that. And then there is the other uh, community that is working on like even new uh, languages. So uh, we struggle doing that. We have seen like uh, now there are more, um, let's say, tools that can help the integration, but still there is not like the perfect effective way to integrate uh, the software from Fortran, C++ and... Uh, um, yeah, I imagine and, you've, you've yeah, got yeah. lots of existing models that you need to build yeah. new data assimilation approaches in. So there's a kind of related question from Simon about um, saying building traditional twins seems a lot more work in terms of the infrastructure required to support data assimilation and real-time modeling. So in similar work, I've found a big knowledge gap between the domain expert modelers and the people who work on the infrastructure. And how have you effectively bridged that gap? Uh, so straightforward, learning new vocabularies. <laughs> the, the, I, can, I can say that the main challenge is uh, talking to people. I'm not joking because sometimes we, we use some terminologies, they use completely different terminologies to mean the same stuff. So the first, um, and I've, I've been working now with lots of different people from environment, but also from uh, doctors, for example, right? And, and, and so anytime, all the time is learning a new vocabulary is painful, but this is fundamental. And then, yeah, the feedback uh, from there at all the time. And um, it's not like having meetings once in a while, but actually actively involve them in the discussions. 
that's yeah interesting to hear so we've got there's a, a project a NERC project we've got uh, working on for an information management framework for digital twins and those vocabulary aspects are a very important part of it yeah, trying to <laughs> yeah, make people understand. I can imagine. that's great well I think that's all we've got time for today thanks very much I'll thank again um Rosella for for your presentation and the discussion and thank to remind everybody much. else that we've got we've recorded the session we'll make it available soon to watch again on the website and on YouTube um and remind people again to subscribe to the YouTube channel and I'll put the link um or the link's going to go in the chat again um and just to say that the next webinar is going to be on uh, find it very briefly on the uh, friday the 14th of july um by professor ian styles from queen's university belfast on ai for biological imaging and sensing um so yeah thanks again um rosella thanks, thanks very much you. and uh thanks everybody. bye everybody